Okay, so good afternoon. Thanks for joining this session. The whole idea of uh, insight from Help Propo is to, you know, look at the pattern, usage pattern as well as patterns on the problem which user are encountering when they make use of the Node.js and what are the type of problems which they report in the Help Propo and see uh, how, what we can do as a team to discuss those things at high level and see if there is any trend that is happening and if there is any uh, thing which we can do at the design level, at the code level, or at the documentation level back in the code so that the overall user experience is improved. And so that's the whole idea about this. I've been spending some time on the help report for the last maybe one and a half years or so. So a uh, couple of caveats, these are my personal observations, not necessarily representing any group or the project as a whole. And then Help Propo is a running repo. That means over the years, there have been hundreds of issues. I'm not representing all the issues as such. The ones which came uh, across me, the ones which I was part of, uh, you know, problem determination, etc., are the ones which are represented here. And then <clears throat> I put recommendations against each of the issues or each of the problem patterns. Again, those are not necessarily hard bound or uh, final recommendations. I just put some some observations as based on my understanding. As a team, my expectation was that we look at that as a baseline and then apply some collective intelligence and see what we can do about that. So that's the whole idea. Then uh, let's look at the first one. <clears throat> Against each of the problems, I, I guess I have four of them at high level. Each of them, I have the problem and the root cause and the recommendation. So NPM and Node installation, reinstallation and uninstallation or migration, uh, reinstallation or migration. This is by far the most common issue which we see across the board without any exception. So if you have 100 open issues, you see around 40 of them belonging to this category. Mm -hmm. So that's a, that's a very conclusive scenario. So what is the problem? Problem is users are not able to install Node.js. Probably they get exceptions, they get um, you know, a file not found or some native level crashes or things like that. Then they're not able to upgrade they had a valid, healthy node installation, but when it comes to upgradation, it breaks in very strange manner. And then uninstallation again, either uninstallation is not complete or it leaves some, uh, you know, files in the file system, etc. And they get these sort of exceptions as well. When it comes to NPM, all the things which apply for the node JS installation apply as it is. In addition to that, a number of other issues like proxy failures, network connectivity failures, the mismatch of the version between Node and NPM, and all sort of things. So I would say NPM installation issue is by far more problematic than the Node.js uh, related issues. So the root cause, in my opinion, is that you have a number of distributors uh, with respect to the board. At high level, I will classify into two. One is the one which has um, a native installer, something like uh, app get or brew installed in case of Mac OS. The second classification is uh, the distributor has a custom installer, something like the one which official uh, Node.js community uh, delivers which has an MSI installer, something which is associated with that. So native installer versus custom installer. Now, if you install Node.js, say version 10 using the native installer, and then you want to install or upgrade Node version to 11 or 12 using a, another installer, then there is no coordination between these installers about where are where you kept the cache files, where you kept the hidden files or the configuration files, etc. What are the shortcuts which you kept? And or when you upgrade, which items you need to delete, which items you need to replace, and things like that. That is by far 
the most common root cause in my opinion <clears throat> and then when it comes to npm it's more tricky i haven't looked at the npm client as such to understand what is the type of root cause problems that comes in but in in my opinion npm client which is npm cli.js performs an, a number of operations like resolving the module connecting with the network and then look at some of the cache files in your local file system and then try to make some meaning out of it and finally uh, downloads the module and then if there is a native component in that you build it using the build tool chain and then finally install the module in that thing, in that sequence of operations there could be n number of uh, expectations that could fail for example uh, the version of nodejs which uh, the tool figures out is not necessarily the node that is prevalent in the system and things like that at high level i will classify that in the two one is resolution of the npm script itself as we know npm Uh, client is a JavaScript, which is npm cli dot js, and that is resolved through a number of magical steps. npm as a script is available in the path, and then that script basically redirects to another file called npm cli dot js. So that resolution can fail based on what shortcut you kept in your file, etc. Then the npm cli dot js in turn resolves the node executable itself because the first line in the npm cli dot js is um, a shebang and no which means you are resolving back the node and then this multi level resolution can uh, go for a toss like any that would be one of the uh, main root cause in my opinion about npm installation or on installation failure i absolutely no idea have no idea about uh, what are the steps that are involved within the nodejs the npm cli dot js to make any recommendation but in my opinion the installation should be standardized across all the distributors we should have a conversation about uh, with all the distributors of how you want to install or how you want to uninstall or upgrade should we have a standard a protocol or a steps that is uh, you know agreed upon by all the distributors so when you're saying distributors do you mean like uh through uh the debian registry uh and like the clouds and like how they're doing it and their thing yeah okay. so you're talking about like anyone that's basically giving a developer a note yeah okay that's right. okay yeah. i just wanted to make sure i understand that yeah so uh, in my in my understanding node node source distribute node Red Hat distribute nodes and uh, the the brew the macros guys and our official installation as well. Okay. So yes, <laughs> each of them have their own protocols. They assume that it is and the end user uses their own tools to install or yeah. uninstall. So that's where the problem comes. And then when it comes to the uh, npm installer. i commonly look at the npm debug log the debug dot log to figure out what is going on so that's a that's okay it's not a bad tool at all it provides a step by step a log about what is happening and what stage the things are failing etc but one of the uh, serviceability pitfall i would say in the log is that the logs the log provides too many information for a minor issue whereas for a very critical issue it doesn't provide any information so basically the the balancing of the log frequency or the normalization of the quality of the log is very very uh, skewly represented i mean to say uh, if you are downloading if you are connecting the internet if you are uh, natively compiling or if you are caching some information is a high level uh, structure high level activities the log is not necessarily uh, normalized or you know <clears throat> recorded in in proportion with the actual activity or its nature that is being captured so that's the key thing i want to highlight there then uh, i have no idea about who owns the npm client at this point <laughs> i believe there is an upstream but 
I don't see anybody raising a PR or uh, addressing an issue as such. We always download the upstream and bundle it in yeah. Node.js. Yeah. It's NPM. I was going to say, I've had a question about that recently. Is it, is it NPM Inc., the company that employs people that work on that specifically? Well, so NPM, there's NPM org, right. and there's NPM Inc. Okay, yeah. NPM Inc., regardless of who, right, whether it's in the org or the Inc., I believe Inc. ultimately holds the IP for things. Yes. So. They, they currently hold the IP for this year. Yeah. I, I just did a course on this recently explaining what those things were. And I was always wondering, like, that we, some, it, we're derailing. But for yeah. now, yeah. it is yeah, it's for at NPM. OK. I'm sorry, do, do they control what gets merged in? Like yes, what? they have 100%. Ultimately, yes. Yeah. Okay. yeah, I don't think they've get, well, that said, I am not sure whether they have granted merge rights to anyone outside of the company. I believe they were working towards that. They, that they were, and it, they did not end up working in open, so they kind of So they hold, the, the, they hold the commitments. Yes. Oh, absolutely, yes. yes. Yeah. That's my thoughts. Yeah, then I guess the, the most important thing that we should be looking at is NPM owns the NPM client, but the issues or the problems that's coming from the installation is always reported against Node.js. Mm -hmm. So either we should have a documentation or a best practice that says it should all get redirected over there, or we should have a better stake or an ownership with the NPM client. Oh, like um, a reader, like a direct, like directing them to the NPM dot community for questions right. related yeah. to NPM. Like an auto response, yeah. like an auto one of the given ones. Yeah. And this is a dumb question, I think, but no. NPM. Is, is that not recommended for folks to start with NBM? Would that help with the, oh, I installed eight 18 months ago, and now I have to install 10, but I forgot how I installed eight? Yeah. Do so we recommend that? We, we do recommend NBM, but the problem is it's only uh, Linux and Mac. It oh, doesn't right. work on yeah. Windows. NBM Windows exists, I mean, but it's not feature compatible, and it's not great. Yeah. And like, I mean, I guess I guess with Windows 10 and WSL getting better, like, I'm more like I might get a Windows machine just to use that to see if it works and like what the issues are. But other than that, like yeah, for Windows it's, it does work. That's how I recommend people in the courses I'm making right now install you know, through NVM. Yeah. The Windows. Uh, They're used to that by now. But they shouldn't have to. Be. Yes, exactly. There is a package manager for Windows called Chocolate Seed. Yes. Yeah. Anyone familiar with that? Yes. Is that a no package manager? No, it's a it's a package. Windows package manager. Oh, like, like Brew maybe? Mm -hmm. It's basically Brew on. Well, I think there's Brew on Windows, but it's also <laughs> Brew for. It's basically Brew for Windows. <laughs> I see like a third party maintaining a Node.js install. To yeah, I believe that is also sometimes a recommended download. Interesting. I've I've seen that in terms of Microsoft. Okay. I don't know if it's true or not, but it's good. But sorry, we totally do rattle here. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. So it may be a good idea to look at tooling as an option to redirect the issues to NPM. But then <clears throat> my question would be, if the open culture or the the whole process of addressing issues in the NPM community, yeah, if it is totally different than the inclusiveness, the openness, and the activity, activeness of the Node.js community. Yeah. And eventually, there is a gap in the user experience. In, in an ideal world, what would the community like? The interaction with, like, say, you know, get because uh, I know npm like totally closed their issues on GitHub. Yeah. Uh, if if they you know undid that or like some other method to do that on GitHub, what would that look like to you to be able to work well with the, the help repo? Yeah. So I'm curious about that and how you can deal with that. I mean, in my opinion, we having better control of the NPM CLI .js, the whole installation or migration process. Yeah. Uh, if I were owning the NPM CLI, yeah. what I would do is I will look at improving the overall logging process or the serviceability process mm -hmm. and better document. Uh, if, if you remember, we have a well-trained documentation around uh, module resolution. Mm -hmm. I mean, do you look at the node modules in the current folder? Then you look at the parent folder like that. You recursively go up to the vertex of the file system and then look at the package.json 
or there is a sequence of steps, maybe some 20, 25 steps that's involved. That is well known, well documented, and well consumed. So if, if you have something of that sort for the NPM installation process, that will really help. So, but for that, we might need a more better control on the client. Okay. We should be able to recapture the code. We should be able to put a more uh, structured logs and then a better documentation. Okay. Yeah. So if NPM communities uh, able to do that, that is better. Yeah. Otherwise, uh, somebody in the code doing that, uh, I guess, would improve the situation. Okay. Wait, so, so are you saying you make the recommendation that we should have access, we should have commitment to NPM? That's right, yeah. yeah. Or, I mean, to get the conversation starting, somebody from the Node community taking this ownership or championing this as an initiative, I mean, having a conversation with NPM, then look at the ways to improve the overall NPM installation experience. Yeah, I would say this is that has happened many times. Yes. Many, um, many, so it's many. not that we have not, it's not for trying, okay. um, but it's sort of similar. I think if we look at um, like B, right, other upstreams and examples of that for Node yeah. um, and how we're affected by it, we had to spend, I think, nearly a year um, in advocacy and talking, uh, people from our project talking with that team to get them to, to work with us. And they were already um, very, they were amicable and they already had relationships, but we sort of codified it as we need to be communicating on a regular basis yeah. um, so that we're both benefiting from each other's work instead of sort of like feeling the effects of, of somebody's work. Yeah. Whereas with NPM, we have sort of the added complication of have prior uh, community, uh, poor community relations between um, NPM folks and the rest of the Node project um, early on the node projects, some of the contributors were much more forceful mm -hmm. in um, sort of the uh, demanding, a little bit entitled in terms of we need, like, of course we need to have access to be able to um, modify NPM, but that um, that's like stepping into somebody else's project and telling them that like you're going to take over. Okay. Um, and I think because of that, this the insensitivity then um, it sort of put us at a standstill. And unfortunately, um, or no, I shouldn't say unfortunately, the leadership and the people who worked on that have not, it has not changed. Mm -hmm. So they still have that memory in the history of not working well with us, even if on our side, yeah, the group, the people have changed. Yeah. Um, so it wouldn't, it's not that we shouldn't have that conversation again, um, because it's a new group, yeah. um, but it's, that's, um, that's like a, that's a, project. Yeah. Um, it's not it, because I think that's it, this all ends up being side effects, right? Of um, our past choices. Yeah. And it's not even our past choices. It's like individuals in the project. Yes. <laughs> the project's past choices. But just to give you, uh, if you were, if you were to ever suggest that on GitHub, just to give you a heads up, yeah. mm -hmm. that would be some of the feedback you may end up seeing. Okay. Sure. Let's move on in the interest of time. Yeah, yeah, sorry. Yeah. No, no, go ahead, go ahead. Okay. That's fine. So next one is on the child process. So this is uh, not necessarily a, a coherent or a you know connected set of problems, but probably discrete and uh, you know one of its kinds in many situations. So we have an outstanding problem of truncated child data. So what that essentially means that if you're spawning a child process and then it's a small running process like a CLI or a tool that just prints a piece of information and just exits. So because the console log is asynchronous, the main process, the main child process do not really wait for the console to be completely flushed out and it comes back to the parent, essentially losing the data. So this has been uh, the Ever since uh, I can remember, I, I joined the project, I seen this issue. And on and off, we, we get people complaining about that. We know the problem, what it is. We know how to solve it is, but there are side effects. There are known solutions which uh, have 
more severe side effects than the advantage it can bring about, etc. But there are one or two options which I believe is something which we can uh, look at to solve this once and for all. Race conditions with spawn is basically again a design level issue. When you spawn the child process, at up to some point in the protocol, the a child do not exist, which essentially means all the issues that's coming out of the spawn sequence is thrown back to the caller in a synchronous manner. And the moment the child comes into the life, then any issues that is coming to the process, which is just got born, cannot be passed back to the caller in a synchronous manner because it's running asynchronously. The child is completely independent. So that means uh, the rest of the errors are thrown as in a synchronous error back into the parent. So what that essentially means is when you're spawning a process based on where the issue happens, the caller should be prepared to catch the error either in a synchronous manner or in an asynchronous manner. And if you don't have enough insight about what type of problems you are expecting, uh, unexpected issues can happen in the in the consumer side. So that's a pretty tricky level thing. We don't have a complete solution for this yet, other than documenting this fact, which I just stated. That is, it's a it's a sequence of activities, and up to some point, the caller should expect it as a synchronous error, and beyond that, it should be an asynchronous error. That should be stated and documented as a protocol. <clears throat> so that's what essentially I meant by normalizing the runtime and non runtime error handling. And then uh, performance and footprint issues with the spawn. So <clears throat> the way the spawn works is you replicate the parent process in all its aspects by the fourth system part and then try to implement the child process within the fourth child. So depending on the nature of the child, say the child is a small Unix process like LS or PWD, essentially what you're doing is just replicating the whole Node.js process in the child address space. And depending on how much memory the, child, the parent has been consuming, say 2 GB or 3 GB, for example, you're allocating as much of memory for the child, basically, causing a lot of memory footprint issues. There could be a better capability than the memory footprint replication. And one class of customers can get affected because of this. And especially if you're uh, running things in a cloud deployment, for example, memory is uh, charged. And then this particular way of doing things can potentially cause uh, issues for the consumer. So the recommendation is look at ways to spawn the child in a customized manner, depending on either the deployment scenario or the type of child you are spawning, et cetera. So uh, fortunately, the spawn API has um, a parameter called options, which can be overloaded with you know, additional flags or additional input which you can pass. So that means the API provides a capability or the opportunity just need to look at what is the right way to implement it. Does, if child's process spawns and the memory of the parent is low, but then the, the child process is higher, will that cause an error as well, or will that cause an issue? Can it, um, can it grow? It can grow. Okay. Yeah. okay. So the child process at, at the time of this fork yeah. doesn't require any memory. Yeah. The child process grows organically based on its memory demand which will anyway need fresh piece of memory. It, it cannot make use of the parent's memory as it is. Yeah. Say for example, the parent is one GB and the child is going to be 10 GB. The one GB replicator into the child is of no use to the child. It has to anyway allocate new fresh oh, energy. Yeah. So essentially the one GB of parent memory becomes useless to the child and it becomes an overhead in the whole system. Is there a reason why we've not addressed that? 
Oh, we don't have to get into it. It's yeah. a thing. Yeah. So there are discussions that's happening. Yeah. So it, it, it's about it, be able to implement it in a platform neutral manner okay. and being able to do it in a non-breaking manner. Mm -hmm. So child process has been there in the field for quite some time. Yes. So just, just not touching anything. At yeah, yeah. No. So the third one is embedding scenario. Um, embedding basically means um, you know using Node from an existing native application. That means you don't use Node.exe or the Node binary as it is. Instead, you have a you know your own uh, native process which is running a major chunk or a larger chunk of your workload. And you just want to make use of Node for a specific subset of your workload. Say, for example, an I/O bound or a uh, interactive workload as such. <clears throat> so, the the problem which we see is that <clears throat> the embedders do not know how do you consume Node. What is the entry point to the Node? And what are the things which you need to initialize? What are the things which you, as an embedder, can customize? And what are the control flow points? What are the tunables, etc. So, if you look at the main uh, file that uh, Node implements for its entry point, which is Node.cc or Node main.cc, you see at least three or uh, three start functions, um, four init functions, and one main function. So, basically, these are entry points which have different types of abstractions. One, for example, one start function takes the whole uh, arguments as it is for your input. N another init function takes, or another start function takes a subset of that. Instead, uh, provide you with the flexibility of defining the inspector, or defining the V8 engine, or the isolate, and things like that. So. Essentially, you have five or six discrete APIs to call and control the sub modules of node change. This is good, but it can it confuses people. You don't you don't necessarily have five or six discrete uh, use cases for embedding. You may have two or three, but you may have maybe more than that. But the whole idea is: uh, do we have a documentation, or do we have a you know, higher level of abstraction that any embedder can be able to relate. For example, an embedder may not be interested in customizing an inspector. It will just go by what the Node.js is, is providing as it is as a capability. And again, if you are embedding Node.js, you don't necessarily need to uh, control the V8 engine as it is. So the whole idea is uh, either top to the embedding uh, users or you know collect these feedbacks and then look at what are the two or three discrete way of embedding Node.js, define it, expose the entry points, and then document. At this point, one of the main pain points is there is absolutely no documentation. So <laughs> people look at the C APIs, I mean look at the source code, and then they open questions in the Node.js slash help repo. And then they just get around. The so a question I have: yeah. What are so I know Electron is an embedder. Are there any other examples of embedders existing, like well-known <laughs> embedders or things like that? Mm -hmm. So uh, I know IBM have we have a product called IIB, mm -hmm. IBM Information. I, sorry, IBM Integration Bus. Mm -hmm. So in that, it's a messaging system. Mm -hmm. We have a lot of legacy uh, data that is coming from the mainframe. And we implement a queue and things like that. So there is a well-grained APIs, so well-grained uh, data flow that's happening. Yeah. And then based on the the type of the message, if it is highly asynchronous, we pass it on to a uh, node. Yeah. So there is a there is a way of embedding node. We find this issue maybe two years back, and then we are we are trying to see what is the best way of abstracting, best way of uh, invoking the right abstraction within the Node.js. So that's when we looked at well, which are the entry points that are, that are making sense. Yeah. Yeah. 
one of the questions, so I mean, I, I've talked to Shelley Moore on the electron team a lot about this kind of stuff that I don't understand. But um, would it be helpful for people to, like you said, you know, there's no documentation. Um, would it be helpful to, like, as someone who doesn't understand C++ at all, yeah. um, would it be helpful to kind of go build out the structure of that and allow people to go fill it out? Yeah. Or would it be, or, or would that be kind of pointless of like, hey, we have this, but there's no content. Uh, someone will maybe eventually fill it out. Yeah, makes uh, sense. Do you, which way do you feel like would be, like, would that be helpful, I guess? Yeah, so my way of thinking is if you document the existing state of the fact as it is, it can cause problems mm -hmm. because the current state may not be optimal. Yeah. Uh, for example, tomorrow come, somebody comes and they want to embed more in a particular way, which is neither existing nor documented. So then we are breaking the situation. So yeah. the ideal starting point is get the feedback yeah. from the uh, actual embedding usages and then look at holistically or from a design perspective, what are the different discrete way of embedding more, yeah. and then freeze on that, then document. Okay. Okay, that's yeah. I guess this is the last one. Yeah. So streams. <coughs> I would say this is not a pattern as such from the help report, but it's it's there in help report as well. Anybody who's uh, working on code would also say this is a ever recurring pattern of uh, problem statement. People complain that uh, the event, say X event is occurring after Y event, whereas I was expecting Y to be happening first and vice versa. And this one keeps uh, keeps changing. Um, I mean, keep keep occurring. The X and Y can be P and Q, but every time we see the life cycle events of the stream are uh, completely uh, coming in an arbitrary manner. And then uh, transform stream streams, I see uh, quite many users complaining about. Uh, I want to transform a particular stream into a particular pattern, but I don't see the data coming out. I see the original data that's coming out, the transformation is not really happening, or uh, the particular data event is not triggering itself. And multi-level piping is like A pipe, B pipe, C, probably the most common use case, whereas A and B piping into C, or A piping into B and C, these are uh, you know different scenarios of piping. So, not necessarily all combinations uh, produce the data in a, in a desired manner. It's not necessarily because uh, there is a severe problem in the Node.js, but because these are not necessarily uh, you know, defined as valid use cases. So as and when people raise issues, we look at that and see, oh, okay, there is a, there is a specific use case that is missing. A and B piping together into C is something which we did not Think about. Let's implement that kind of thing. And there could be real bugs as well. I am not sure about that. But fundamental problem is that the stream API does not have a specification around that. Just like any API will have a well-defined uh, input and a well-defined output, documented, and the design follow the documentation, or the documentation follow the design. Here, the the fact is that how the stream works becomes the expectation, or that becomes the documentation. But uh, assuming, or you know, keeping in mind that streams need to work with a number of other processes, probably outside of Node.js as well. There could be child processes. There could be other endpoints coming from the network, which is feeding you with the data. Then you need to adhere to the protocol that is defined at the other endpoint or you need to align with that expectation. So if those are not uh, matching, then the result is basically this one, the hub facade uh, life cycle events. So here my clear recommendation is that we should have a specification. By specification, I mean the, a set of defined principles, set of expectations about how the exposed API should work. 
in any sort of implementation. The implementation can be customized, but the expectation should be standard. And that should work seamlessly across all endpoints, other child child process interactions, and things like that. Just so I understand you clearly, um, yeah. In a, in the example of the rights after end event, um, this is specifically like a, a problem in user land where people are implementing streams improperly. No, no, no. This is basically with uh, HTTP or any other APIs in the code mm -hmm. which internally make use of streams. But the, the whole point is, uh, though you are making use of a core stream, the data control is uh, within the application. The stream do not control the data as such. The, the velocity at which the data comes, or the data type of the data, and the endpoint from which the data coming, these are completely uh, in the control of the application. Okay, yeah. so, so someone somewhere, maybe that created the API that you're consuming, streams or something yeah um, they're breaking they're the one that is particular perhaps sending a right after the end event is yeah. that what i'm hearing yeah that's cool. yeah that's what i would yeah, consider it's a user land i'm just probably not using the term properly so um so they're, they're, they're not in, they're not using someone somewhere is not using streams in their events properly because there's not a well-defined spec for how to use them oh okay let me clarify like once again mm -hmm. so we have a stream which is said basically you are making use of an HTTP capability. And as an HTTP client, uh, you know that the response coming from the server is actually a stream. Then if you implement the callback for the data event, for the end event or the finish event, etc. So these are implemented in the user land. The callback belongs to the user, whereas the trigger of the event belongs to the code. So user as a user, the expectation of these callbacks are that they get executed in a particular order. Mm -hmm. Say, for example, um, n uh, right happened first and then n, right. whereas that expectation is not known. Okay. So definitely the responsibility or the break is happening in the code. Mm -hmm. yeah. So that's pretty much I have. So uh, just to reiterate what I said in the beginning, these are not necessarily the whole problems in the Node.js uh, support repo as important. They're probably the ones which I believe is following a pattern at the moment. And then uh, we also looked at the, the root cause and what are the recommendations that can be made for some of them as discussed, not necessarily will work as it is. We need a better approach, but some of the things which we know what can be done in a systematic manner. Somebody who is interested, take ownership, champion it. Basically, ownership not necessarily mean implement the end-to-end -end solution for that, but just to kickstart the conversation in, in cases or define some uh, milestones and you know see if we can get engaged with the people and uh, you know, delegate some part of the work, then have that as a initiative and a completion. Do you have a link for your slides that you can share? Come again. Do you have a link for your slides? I don't have. Share? I can share it with you. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, I feel like something if it hasn't already been done is like the recommendation made as like an issue filed in the relevant repo alongside with like the problem in root cause and like yeah. volume that you've seen yeah is such great user feedback if you haven't already done it or I if, done yeah it. I, I mean i don't think you need to do it alone either but um i think it's just really good justifications for people considering how we're building things out moving forward or where we can devote time, right? Like defining the node streams back. Like, yeah. I'm sure, Matteo would have very much agree with that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but it's just about the time to find to do it or the people, right? Yeah. Maybe tagging. Mm. You yeah. can use more if, if it's easy enough for you to tag things, then people can subscribe to the tags. Yeah. It's always good to have yeah. broken use cases to test again. Yeah, yeah. this is great. We put so much work into this. Yeah, it's pretty work. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you.